I was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. My grandmother had a stroke and we moved from there. I was two weeks old, went back to the farm where my mother could take care of her. I lived there till I was 18. I probably don't remember much until I was four or five years old. And uh, I went to a backwood country school. And uh, the first year we had to walk uh, it was about a mile and a half. I was just a kid then, you know, that everybody was the same. We didn't go hungry. We lived on the farm. We had pigs and goats and cows and chickens and ducks and everything else. We never went hungry. We went into town when we were kids, probably two or three times a year. We didn't have a car. We didn't have anything just like everybody else. We didn't have electricity, we didn't have a telephone, we didn't have a radio. We had a pump on the back porch. My mother's washing machine was a black pot out in the backyard. I had an older brother and a younger. Uh, we lived in a big house. We just played around the dirt. I don't know what, we didn't have any store-bought toys. Uh, we made our own little wagons and I did make a race car. My mother gave me an old iron and board. <laughs> well, my mother had a black woman that lived there on the farm like she's part of the family. She used to help her and she'd bring her. My play buddies were three black boys our age that, that lived there. Uh, the nearest white family was probably a mile and a half away. It was three classes in one room, the first, second, third grade, and uh, there's probably 30, 35 kids. And when I was in the fourth grade, I got a picture of it. It was 47 kids in that class. It was just a country school, like I said. It was, and had a pump in the yard, and I had high side back, and you took your lunch to school and sometimes the older kids might miss a day or two when they were messing with peanuts or cotton and things like that, but usually everybody was there. One thing that people laugh at is if a plane came over, which was very seldom, Everybody in the school ran outside to look because, they, you know, back then there wasn't many planes flying about. The teachers and all ran out. <laughs> we walked home. We'd pass a country store and stop and get a loaf of bread for a nickel. Mama would give us a nickel every morning. She'd fix our lunch the next day. One day we got home. She said, where's the bread? It'd gone up to six cents. We couldn't get a loaf. And she was shocked. <laughs> but uh, like I said, we never went hungry or anything because we had, and I didn't know every, nothing about the depression. My daddy worked. My daddy wasn't a farmer. He worked, he was a salesman. He worked uh, several jobs and he finally 
in uh, 1934, my uncle had started a, a, a wholesale barbecue business and he died and my daddy ended up with that. My daddy was working for him. They, they didn't sell it to the public, they sold to restaurants. And he traveled as far south as down to Fayetteville and up to Richmond and to Norfolk, probably a hundred mile radius of where we live. And he was out, he had a barbecue house there at home and they would cook six pigs about every other day. And he would make the run when he came in at night, he would stop at the slaughterhouse and pick up four or five during the tobacco season when everybody was in time we might cook eight at a time. My grandpa did lose the farm during the depression but I had an uncle that had graduated from state and he was working for the agriculture department. He quit his job and came home and scuffled up enough people to loan him money and bought the farm back. And we lived there. Things started to pick up 34, 35. My daddy was traveling and I would go with him Sometime I had been to Richmond and Norfolk and Raleigh and Durham and, uh, you know, I had been out around the country. And uh, when I started driving when I was 14, you didn't have to have driver's license back then. We would started going to school in the city and in time, the city. My brother was older and he drove and we went to the school in time. And uh, then we got to go into the movies and football games and all the other stuff that kids do when they're 15, 16, 17, so. The war had come along in Europe, which all the plants, everything, everybody was working and wanted to work. A little bit of everything, cotton and peanuts at that time were probably the big crop, but we grew wheat, grew soybeans, corn, when my granddaddy was farming, he farmed about 200 acres as well as I remember. And it was a, he ran a crossroad country store and he had a high school of kids like my mother and he had four boys, I believe, and three girls. And my mother was born in the, the house out there in the woods. My brother, my youngest brother was born there. And uh, it was a big house. I mean, it had five big bedrooms in it, two or three kids in each bedroom and uh, all on one floor, wasn't any two-story high. And the kitchen and the dining area was all from it with a breezeway kind of between it. And a, we were big time. We had a pump on the back porch right outside the kitchen. Most of it was Still had a well in the backyard. Uh, but uh, all of them are 
family went to college, which was unusual at that time. I mean, one of them didn't go. He World War One took him, uh, and he came back. He didn't go back to school. She had three brothers that went to college, and she had one younger sister that caught a fire at a fireplace on Christmas and burned, and she died a day or two later. She was three years old. My mother went to college for one semester. Well, she might have stayed for one year. She went to Chapel Hill, I think is North Carolina now. But she came home, she was so homesick, she wouldn't go back. She didn't go back. All her daddy's people, her daddy didn't go, he didn't have, I don't think he went for about a year or two to school. He had another brother that was a farmer and didn't, he went to the fourth, fifth grade, but he had three other brothers that were lawyers. Three of her aunts, which her daddy's sisters, were school teachers. One of them was married to a doctor, and one of them was married to a fella that ran a hardware business. And uh, wasn't any of them went into farming. One of them, the one that came back home and bought the farm, the, her youngest brother, after my grandpa lost it, uh, is the only one that ever farmed. The one after World War II, I mean, after World War I, he ran a dairy for a while and he ran a, I don't know what he did, but he died real young. He was always kind of sick after the war. My mother, all of her brothers and sisters had died by the time they were 45 years old except the one that farmed. He lived to be 73, and she lived to be like five months of being 100. And all we had a skillion cousins up in there, and I think it's about three of us left now. He got out of the army and he went, he lived in Enfield, which was 10 miles away, 15 miles from, as the train goes to Rocky Bank. He worked at a grocery store over there for a while. I think he was working for Swift and Company selling meat from grocery store to store when they got married. And then when my grandma had the stroke, I, she had just got out of the hospital. So we went back there and then my granddaddy, I mean my daddy, I might have told he worked first. The depression had come on then and the mid twenties. He worked at a tobacco he had gone when he first got out of the army, he went to Richmond and took a business administration course. He quit school in the eighth grade. But he went to that business school in Richmond. He came back and then during the Depression, he worked in a tobacco warehouse as a, in the office, book band. Then he ran a pool room for just a few months. And then a fella that he knew at 
sold everything in the world, peddled it around from store to store, country stores. It was more country stores than it was in town back then. Every crossroads had a country store on each corner. He drove, that fella had had a mild stroke, and my daddy drove for him. And then that fella died, and my daddy took that deal for two or three years until I think I told you about my uncle starting the barbecue business. Well, then that's the next thing my daddy did. He ran that barbecue operation. And during the meantime, he became an auctioneer. And he would auction at a stock market like this one that pit the street here. He went to one in Rich Square, which was about 15, 20 miles that way. On Thursdays, he would had a sale there. Every Tuesday, he went to Rocky Mount to stockyard. So he did. He started doing that early 40s, 40, 41, before I left home, and he ran the barbecue. I had turned into a barbecue cook before I went into service. And then when I left, my younger brother, did it and uh, till he finally quit and after the war in 47 the its restrictions got so bad on food and this and that and living out there with uh, no running water and pumping it out of the well and all that mess he just decided it it was time to get out, plus he was getting up in age, and he quit that and just worked at those stockyards up until he died, really. He wasn't all that old. He was six, 67 when he died. But uh, he didn't have any brothers, sisters, or anything like that. The first thing he drove, he had a little Austin panel body truck. It was about the size of the first little small cars they ever made. It was a British outfit, but they were building them in the U.S. And he drove that for a while, and then he had a, a 34 model Chevrolet panel body truck. And then he had a 36. The war come along, he had a, you couldn't, you could get three gallons of gas for your car a week, which he couldn't couldn't make it on that. So he had he bought a 41, a 40, 41 Pontiac coupe, and they had a big trunk on them. He had the trunk lid taken off and a body built in the back of it like a pickup truck, and you could get more gas for the pickup. But he had cut his, he wasn't going to Richmond and he wasn't going way out up to Raleigh and just locally. And he, like I say, he finally quit that after the war. Plus, it was tough to get gas and get tires and meat and all that mess during the war. So. He had kind of faded out of that by the war's end. When my uncle took over the farm, my granddaddy had had a grocery store. He was 70-some years old, and he opened up. They had rented the store, and the fellow 
built him a new one on another crossroad. So my grandpa opened that back up for a few years. I mean, it, he was 70, like I say. It was just a plaything for him. Well, I remember one store, the fella had a sign over the counter said, in God we trust, others pay cash. <laughs> All of the black people in the community had a little credit account at the crossroads store. I have found one of those diaries or ledgers or whatever back there. I think my brother had it, I don't know where it is, but you could see where everybody come and got a three cent can of potted meat, a 10 cent can of soup. Uh, they'd come get three cent worth of kerosene for the lamps. But it wasn't much, like I say, they had they grew everything. We had, he had a garden, probably an acre big. I mean, my granddad, he, when he lost the farm, he, he played in the garden and messed with the store. But they grew everything in the world. Good gracious, yes, he can which people never even think about now, but they used to can meat. When they would kill hogs, you'd can the meat. and uh, They used everything except the squeal. They would cut up the heart, the liver, and make that pudding that I couldn't eat. And, can't stand to think, think about it. They used it, made sausage, and take the intestines, clean them out, and stuff them with the sausage. And <laughs> that was, that was uh, uh, something. I went into service during when the war came along. And uh, my brother was in the service, but he went back to the farm and lived there till he was, I think he retired. He was about 62 or three. And uh, I don't even know who lives there now. It's changed. Somebody bought it since he died. He didn't have any kids. I went, I had 28 days of basic training and they put me on a destroyer. And I spent 43 months on it. And we ran convoy duties in the Atlantic. We'd uh, escort for uh, the submarines. The Germans had so many, if they'd been in the end, you could walk to Europe. The first trip I made was the invasion of North Africa. And we ran convoys across after that, that we took part there in the invasion of Sicily. In Charleston. Uh, I didn't go back home. My wife had a job and I didn't, so we stayed there. I'd been there ever since. And says Roebuck. She worked across the street. I had a friend that he and I went to service. Had a girlfriend worked in there. 
they had gone to school together and my wife came over to get her to go to lunch. That's where I first met her. And uh, it just went on from there. <laughs> Well, I didn't like it. I remember I, the first time I went home, my daddy asked me how I liked Charleston. I remember telling him if I ever had to go to Florida, if I ever left there, I would go right through Atlanta to get to Miami rather than drive through Charleston. It wasn't like it is now. After we were married a year or two, I bought a couple of acres clean out in the woods to get out of there. But now, you could throw a baseball. I live in North Charleston. A thousand feet, I could be in Hanahan. Or two thousand feet, I could be in Goose Creek, which didn't even exist. There, North Charleston's the third largest city in the state now. If you combine, which you don't know when you leave North Charleston, go to Goose Creek or, or Hanahan, they're all the same. If you put them together, they'd be the largest city in the state. I don't like living there now. Uh, I really haven't ever been thrilled about it. <laughs> but, but the kids grew up there and uh, their family was there. When the war ended, I spent 22 months in the Pacific after we left the Atlantic. The ship I was on was built in Charleston, and they sent it back here and put it out of commission here. And uh, I was on it for, like I said, 40, 43 months. We took part in eight invasions. We were out there in the South Pacific. We started down in New Guinea, which was still wild jungle. I mean, the people there were wearing a little skirt and they looked like they did 2,000 years ago. There wasn't any towns, wasn't no villages. They lived in little shacks. Whenever the ship got underway, you had a you had a battle station and you had a watch to stand. You stood four hours on, eight hours off, four hours on, eight hours off, day in, day out, always. If they had a, if you went to your battle station, I uh, was a loader and a five inch gun. During my off hours, I worked in a what what you would call between your four-hour watch. You would have eight off if it came. If you had the twelve to four watch, you didn't have to work the time you were off. But if you had the eight to twelve, then you would work whatever gang you were in if you were. I was in a, a maintenance crew. It was five of us in it. We took care of the welding. If a door broke, you fixed it. If a pipe leaked, you fixed it up. Uh, all of that junk. And one of my duties in that crew, I don't know why, that crew took care of dropping and raising the anchor, but that was one of my duties. Every time we stopped, I operated the anchor winch. If we fueled at sea, which we did, we operated with a carrier group, 
we would fuel about every three days and you'd go alongside a tanker and they'd run a line over and the same winch that ran the anchor controlled it and they would bring over these six inch hose, two of them, get the fuel from the carrier. It'd take an hour, hour and a half to do that. And we would pick up, if those guys went, were shot down, we would, <laughs> we'd pick them up. And if we took one back to the carrier, they'd give us 10 gallons of ice cream for it. We didn't have any ice cream or Cokes or nothing on that ship I was on. It was just small. We had about 230 men. Terry and I got one boy, a son, and that was it. I mean, he, my brother didn't ever have any kids, and he always tried to talk him to come up here, come up here, and farm with me. And my boy decided that he wanted to be a farm. The day he got out of school, the next day he got the train up there. And he's lived in North Carolina ever since then. He was 17, I believe. Uh, he lived with my brother for a couple of years and decided he got married, really. Married a girl, a couple of farms down the road and decided he wasn't making enough money farming. So he gave that up and he went to work for the state and he retired from them. He worked with the Forest Service. He retired two or three years ago and he still lives in North Carolina. <laughs> but uh, Terry went off to college and met Frank, she came back home for a year. And they got married and she's been here ever since. And me and the boss lady have been down there ever since. So we didn't have much. When they were kids, we had a tent. We used to go camping a lot, but uh, work, work, work. I didn't have any trade. I didn't know anything. So I took up body work. I worked at oh, Chrysler dealership. I worked a couple of independent shops. I had a thought I could, was smart enough to make it big time. I had a shop of my own and like to starve to death and I finally got smart enough to get me a regular job. I worked for a Oldsmobile dealer, worked for a Pontiac dealer, worked at Pontiac from a guy from Andrews here, Holly McCray. I worked Chevrolet for the last. I worked there 21 years. And that was about it. I mean, work, work, work. But I haven't worked. I've been retired now for 22 years. I don't know if my car breaks down, I have to take it to the shop. I don't know one thing about them. I know the front end from the rear end. I was painting a bicycle one time. After I retired and I went back to the shop, it wasn't far from the house. I asked the painter, I said, you got any? They had hundreds of cans left over. From, 
I said, give me a can of enamel paint for, I want to paint my bike. He said, we don't have any of that. I said, well, let me give me some of this lacquer. We don't use that anymore. Within two or three years after I'd retired, I didn't know a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know anything about your car. If I want to know something about it, I call Bobby. Bobby, Fran, Alston, uh, Christy. I got a one named Reggie, uh, John, Jeff, Caroline, Kate, a bunch of grandkids. <laughs> Well, they didn't stay there. They, they, they left. He worked for the prison system up the Caledonia Prison Farm up in North Carolina. We lived near there. And when he decided he didn't want, want to be a farmer, he worked in the maintenance shop. He was always like me, piddling with tools, wanting to be a mechanic. and. And then he worked for the Forest Service till he retired, but he still, he messed with his old antique tractors now. He got into them and he restored a couple of old tractors. And, and they all seem to be doing pretty well. They, surviving anyway like his wife is a teacher's assistant in a school uh, and he just does whatever he wants <laughs> he's always piddling doing something 